U.S. soccer's women's national team was just at the White House on equal pay day. So let's look over their claims for equal pay and see if the women's national team is actually being paid less than the men's national team solely because they're women. Hey, welcome to the channel. My name is Nate the Lawyer, and you are part of the Brody's Bunch that makes you the jury of today's content. Now, if you haven't already, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel if you like what you hear. So last week was Equal Pay Day. And as an example of unequal pay, Joe Biden brought the U.S. women's national soccer team to celebrate this occasion. But there's been a lot of confusion about the women's national team's claims. So I'm going to provide to you the facts of both their claims and their allegations that specifically they're being paid less than the men's team because they are women. Now, again, after the facts are laid out, it's going to be up to you to decide whether the women's national team is being paid less than the men's national team solely because they're women or whether that's not true. This is the United States Soccer Federation. They negotiate contracts with the men's team and with the women's team separately. So first, let's start off with the men's team. Now, court documents reveal that the majority of men on the men's national team plays for another professional league from MLS to the Premier League, and that these leagues take care of the men's employee benefits. These are things like health insurance, paid vacation, dental insurance, whatever. So the United States Soccer Federation doesn't have to cover any of these benefits for the men's team. Why? Because the men get those benefits from their professional clubs. That their pay structure is very different. And, and this has always been something that's hard to explain because when we came in as players on the women's side, this goes back to my days of playing, we wanted a more guaranteed type of contract. We wanted the security of injury protection because we didn't have big, large contracts with our professional clubs like the mm -hmm. men do, do and did. And so we needed that security. And so we had injury protection, maternity protection, uh, severance pay. And so there were a lot of other assurances we had in there. And it's a very different setup for the women. The judge obviously talked a lot about this um, in, in his judgment and in his opinion, his 32-page opinion about that. So I think it was the fact that the women over the last five years made more money than the men, mm -hmm. and two, that the pay structure was very different. Now, whenever you're talking about collective bargaining agreements and employee contracts, there are two big pots of money, right? There's the employee benefits piece of it. Those things cost money. It costs money for your health insurance. It costs money for dental insurance, right? All of these things cost money. And then you have salaries, right? How much you're getting paid in cash. But these two items have a cost to them. So for the women's national team, they get all of their employee benefits from U.S. soccer and they get salary. While the men's national team, they don't really need the employee benefits because they already get them. Why do they need health insurance again since it's already covered by their clubs? So instead of the employee benefits, they take cash. Let's start with the men's deal the men get paid on a pay-to-play schedule. So first thing we have to understand is that if the men don't play, they don't get paid. And this is a structure on how they get paid. Now, for non-World Cup games, they can make up to $17,000 for a win, $8,000 for a tie, and about $5,000 for every loss. And if they make it to the World Cup, those numbers ramp up. $68,000 if you make it to the World Cup roster. If the team qualifies, you also get $108,000. If the team makes it to the semifinals, each player gets about $240,000. And if the men's team wins it all, they get about $400,000 per person. Now, the men's team didn't qualify for the World Cup, so they only actually received this. They didn't receive any bonuses associated with the World Cup. They didn't qualify. And for employee benefits, again, the men's team doesn't get employee benefits because they're provided by their own clubs. So now that we've seen what happens with the men's team, now it's time to look at the women's team agreement. How does their CBA work out? Now, the first things first, the court did mention that the women's national team was offered the men's deal, the same pay structure as the men, but they rejected it. And they rejected it for this. They wanted employee benefits and 
less salary. So let's start with their bonus structure and how it compares to the men. So here's the men's bonus structure as we looked over before, and here is the women's bonus structure. Obviously, the women are getting less for friendlies and less bonuses for the World Cup. But most of the media has only been reporting that if the women win the World Cup, they make $110,000 per person. But if the men won the World Cup, they would have made $400,000 per person. And this is the basis of the women's lawsuit. Here's the media focused in on this bonus schedule, explaining why it's unfair that if the women win the World Cup, they only get $110,000, where if the men win the World Cup, they get $400,000. The women won their fourth World Cup last month, but earned less than a quarter of what the U.S. men's team would have been paid for the same feat. Kenneth Gregg, CBS News, New York. The lawsuit also highlights pay discrepancy at the World Cup, alleging that the pay was so skewed that when the men's team lost in round 16 of the World Cup in 2014, they received bonuses totaling more than $5 million. The following year, when the women won it all, they received less than $2 million. And overnight, U.S. Soccer released a statement pointing out that the women's national team reached a collective bargaining agreement with the organization two years ago. So now just looking at this, this does look unfair. This looks like unequal pay. But it's only part of the story. See, the women also get employee benefits from U.S. Soccer that the men don't get. What are the employee benefits that the women's national team gets that the men's national team does not. First, they get 20 players at a base salary of $100,000. Then they also get 11 more players with the base salary of sixty-two dollars to $67,000 who play in the National Women's Soccer League. They also get a one-time signing bonus of $230,000. They also get ticket revenue sharing of $150 per ticket at the events. They get $5,000 bonuses for first place in the She Believes tournament or at the Four Nations tournament. They also get severance benefits injury protection, health benefits, dental benefits, vision insurance, pregnancy pay, guaranteed rest time, child care assistance, partnership bonuses tied to increased viewership. They get annual payments for use of their player likenesses, and U.S. Soccer makes a good faith effort to have a minimum number of games. And the women's team are offered two hundred fifty to 350000 for a post-World Cup tour. Remember, none of this is offered to the men. So this chart looks a little deceptive. So instead of this chart, let me lay it out so you can actually see what the women get versus what the men get. And this is it. So in 2017, when the women approved this deal, these were the headlines. U.S. Women's National Team CBA, a victory for all American women's soccer players, not just the best ones. Women's soccer scores higher pay, better conditions, and new labor agreement. An important step U.S. women's soccer team reaches new labor deal. ESPN reports that Mega Rapino said at the time, I am incredibly proud of this team and the commitment we have shown through this entire process. While I think there's still much progress to be made for us and for women more broadly, I think the Women's National Team Players Association should be very proud of this deal and feel empowered moving forward. So it was shocking that two years later, after agreeing to this deal, the women's U.S. soccer team sued for gender discrimination. U.S. women's national team sued soccer's governing body for gender discrimination on International Women's Day. So the women's national team agreed to this deal, rejected the men's deal, and then sued for the men's deal. So what was the women's national team's argument? Well, their argument was the bonus schedules were different. And because these bonus schedules favored the men's national team, for instance, if they win the World Cup, they would have made more if they were under the men's deal. They were being discriminated against as women, and this discrimination was illegal. Now, you would think the women would have been asking simply for the men's deal, like this. Essentially, the same pay-to-play structure as the men's deal, right? You get all the money without any of the benefits. But you would be wrong. The women weren't asking for the men's deal. They were asking for this. They were asking for the same money as the men, but also keeping the same benefits that they already have. And they went to court and sued. Here is what the court said about the women asking to be paid not equal to the men, but more than the men. 
This approach merely comparing what each team would have made under the other team's CBA. It is untenable in this case because it ignores the reality that the men's national team and the women's national team bargain for different agreements which reflect different preferences. And that the women's national team explicitly rejected the terms they now seek to retroactively impose on themselves. The first time the women's national team requested bonuses equivalent to those received by the men's national team was in January 2016. The United States Soccer Federation rejected that proposal, however, because the women's national team was not asking for a pay-to-play agreement similar to the men's national team. Instead, it was asking for all the upsides of the men's national team CBA, namely higher bonuses, without any of the drawbacks no base salary. In May 2016, the United States Soccer Federation offered the women's national team a pay-to-play proposal similar to the men's national team CBA, but the women's national team rejected it, preferring an agreement that involves some elements of guaranteed compensation. So what did this look like in actual salary? So come to find out, the women actually earned more money than the men in total pay, but also on a per-game basis. The men's national team are actually the ones being underpaid based on the numbers. And one of the more interesting pieces about this is if if the teams switch contracts, the women's national team would have gotten paid more under the men's deal, but the men's national team would have also been paid more under the women's deal. Now, after the judge threw out this lawsuit, Joe Biden wrote this, to the women's U.S. national team, don't give up the fight, this is not over, and to U.S. soccer, equal pay now, Or else, when I'm president, you can go elsewhere for World Cup funding. Now, here is Megan Rapinoe and Joe Biden on Equal Pay Day. You see, despite all the wins, I'm still paid less than men who do the same job that I do. For each trophy, of which there are many, and for each win, for each tie, and for each time that we play, it's less. It doesn't matter if you're an electrician, an accountant, or part of the best damn soccer team in the world. The pay gap is real. And this team is living proof that you can be the very best at what you do and still have to fight for equal pay. Now, at the end of the day, we have to realize a couple of things. The women made more money than the men, per game and overall. So if this is about one side being paid more based on gender, the women were paid more, right? The women were actually paid more. Two, the women were offered a similar deal to the men and rejected it. They said, we don't want that deal. That's not good for us, for the reasons that you saw earlier. And then when the women realize that they would have made more money under the men's deal, they sued saying discrimination. We want the men's deal. That would also open up U.S. soccer to being sued by the men saying, well, we want the women's deal, right? They got paid more than us. And just so we're clear about what the women's national team was asking for in this lawsuit, they were not asking for equal pay. We want to be paid like the men. No, they weren't asking for that. They were asking to be paid more than the men. They were asking to keep all of their benefits, all of their severance, all of those perks that they get and get paid what the men got paid. So this wasn't about equal pay. Now, as the women's national team continues to go out and continues to do press, saying that they are being paid less than the men and they are being discriminated against based on their gender, now that you know the facts, is that accurate? Is that true? Let me know how you feel in the comment section. And let me know if you think the women's national team is being discriminated against or not. On your way out, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel if you made it to this part of the video. My name is Nate the Lawyer, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.